Excellence. His, Excelli and His Excellency Anthony Thomas Aquinas Kamuna, ORTTSC, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, has kindly consented to address us this evening. Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, have a seat, please. Good night, everyone. I have to admit, in fact, that these salutations I was about to embark in on, um, you know, has in fact been, a lot of it has been crossed out because a lot of, in fact, the persons we were expecting are all senators and they presently in the parliament engage in, in debate. So I will immediately go to Your Excellency, Ms. Rima Komoda. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, of course, I'm seeing some persons I know quite well. In fact, the British High Commissioner, the, the German Ambassador, um, the Ambassador from Santo Domingo, you know, and, um, and of course, I see, of course, uh, Mr. Sankat, the principal of UWI. Of course, in fact, um, Winston, of course, again, it's really good seeing you. Um, of course, Carib Street is a wonderful place. <laughs> that is where, of course, um, Presentation College is located, of course, our, our alma mater. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, senior government official, directors and members of the respective boards. Of course, Professor Pat Umaharan, director of CRC, members of the corporate community. And of course, Mr. Winston Rudder, Chairman of CDC, TTL, and ADB. Specially invited guest, a very special welcome to the awardees and members of the Coco Farming community, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Her Excellency and I are indeed delighted to host, in collaboration with the esteemed Coco Research Unit of the University of the West Indies, this grand celebration of excellence of Trad and Tobago's brown gold. Recognize we must, an appreciation we must give to the internationally acclaimed awardees and the cocoa industry at large for the accolades received at the International Cocoa Awards in Paris back in 2015. You all have all done this republic proud. It is indeed a great feeling when small becomes big on the world stage. The cocoa industry is the gold mine we are looking for, the El Dorado that we seek in these trying economic times. Her Excellency and I, registered farmers as we are, have cocoa lineage in our blood and our interest and support for the cocoa farming industry and the cocoa entrepreneurs are neither fanciful nor specious. Her Excellency's grandfather, Ranjit Sitaram, once owned some 20 acres of prime cocoa acreage in Pepper Village and Seal Altrace in Faisabad. I do recall when Pope Francis invited Her Excellency and I to the Vatican. She personally helped pick cocoa pods from our family estate in Blanchichez had them fermented and dried, and had hard block cocoa made from these beans by a cocoa payol in Faisabad. And she gave it to Pope Francis as one of our gifts, together with her special recipe, the small grater to make hot chocolate tea, telling him that our cocoa is the best in the world. The world of the Coco Payol is nostalgic to me personally. My great grandfather, Pedro Soillo, was an Amerindian Coco Payol from Venezuela. And many of my old Coco Payol grand uncles and grand aunts worked in the Coco estates in Erin, Lorenzant, Carapal, Los Charos, Palo Seco, Buenos Aires, 
and Rancho Quemado. And so emotionally linked to the land they were, that land of cocoa down in deep south, that when the hurricane of 1933 destroyed the cocoa estates, my great-grandfather became so depressed at the destruction of his cocoa estate, he simply gave up and shortly died thereafter. I do recall drinking a hot homemade cocoa at night when I was growing up in Deep South. It was the standard in all our homes in Deep South. And I even went to a school, Santa Flora Government Primary School, that was ensconced and snuggled in a cocoa field in Santa Flora. I do recall my father telling me about his grand aunts and all the women smoking tobacco in their pipes before they went to pick cocoa and coffee. And my father asking them why. And they indicated that when in fact you smoke that, to to that tobacco, and he said it didn't smell good. It was to run the snakes they encountered in the cocoa field. So I therefore felt a sense of deep pride when I tell you that both Her Excellency and I over the Corpus Christi weekend, with some help of course, we planted over 1,500 cocoa trees in our estate in Faisalabad. <laughs> the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago has gained international repute through its participation and success at the International Cocoa Awards since the year 2009. In 2015, Trinidad and Tobago submitted nine cocoa bean samples to the Cocoa of Excellence program. 146 samples were submitted worldwide. The top 50 were selected based on the criteria of uniqueness and excellence. Remarkably, out of the nine submitted by this country, five were included in the top 50 listing, with two going on to win at the International Cocoa Awards for the Central America and the Caribbean region. What a tremendous feat. But you know, the history of our cocoa and coffee is a bittersweet one. One tongue among many exemplifies that history. In the early 20th century, Faisabad experienced a surreal phenomenon, a type of degenerative growth ignited by a movement from cocoa estates to oil wells and oil grew to the detriment of cocoa. Angelo Bicessa Singh, that amazing self-taught historian, in his recent article, Faisabad About Space, spoke of the eclectic groups of races inhabiting the area of Faisabad, and he stated, and I quote, gradually, a mixture of ethnicities settled in the area, including a few Chinese merchants, Cocoa was king, and almost every substantial resident of Faisabad owed cocoa lands which covered Delai Road, Guapo Road, Oropus Road, and Avocat. End of quote. It all changed, and has now come full circle to haunt us all. The purely agrarian character of Faisabad radically morphed into an oil tongue where black gold took ascendancy over brown gold. And invariably, that majestic Godino River that used to ferry cocoa from the cocoa plantations in Avocat, the old St. John's estate, lost its economic relevance. The cocoa lands were leased over to hungry oil barons and companies becoming oil wells, never to be returned to its pristine glory. But you know what? We must not wallow in the past. And today we can correct that era of blinded vision. When we refuse to have cocoa and oil walk hand in hand. We have the Trinitaria cocoa, a hybrid form from the cross-pollination from midges of the Criollo and Forestero. Forestero trees, a unique blend 
very Trinbegonian, with a flavor that is fruity and even floral at times. High quality, fine cocoa such as this must be strategically sold on the world market to gain maximum profitability. That means, some suggest, low volumes at a high price to selected chocolate chocolatiers to secure reputation and a select market for our cocoa beans. I will, however, leave strategies for the experts and the technocrats to work out what is best for maximum gains. At this stage of our nation's history, cocoa production can compete aggressively with oil as premium revenue earners. Recent statistics, however, have shown that a great majority of cocoa produced locally is not harvested on time. Perhaps in that regard, greater incentives need to be afforded and offered to farmers to encourage them to harvest the cocoa, or perhaps the cocoa industry needs to be so developed that the expectation of more than adequate remuneration will be met in exchange for a unique and high quality product. Ask any farmer for his heart's desire and he will tell you good labor. Labor, yes, that is what he requires. Labor unskilled, semi-skilled, and skill continue to be a challenge for farmers engaged in cocoa production. I recall reading of Camp Tapasad, known for producing some of the best cocoa beans in the world. In an article in a daily newspaper, he stated, and I quote, cocoa is very hard work, and we have a culture that sees anything to do with working hard or working within a field as inferior. Cocoa is in our DNA. We have the capital, knowledge, history, and the lands but we do not have things in place to ensure that. We as Trinidadians should be proud as our country is famous for one of the three types of cocoa, Crelio, Forastero, and Trinitario, Trinitario being the hybrid of the two." End of quote. To solve this perennial problem effectively, government, farmers, and other stakeholders need to engage in productive dialogue to force an implementable plan of action. A possible solution may be to create a pool of unskilled, semi-skilled, and skilled laborers similar to what is being done for retrenched workers in the steel industry so that cocoa and coffee farmers will have immediate access to a pool of reliable laborers for their estates. The Ministry of Agriculture must ensure that it continues its program of training courses in farming and agriculture. And they are excellent courses. Both Her Excellency and I have benefited from going to these courses. We therefore need to collaborate with international connoisseurs, however, to ensure that the training offered is in keeping with international benchmark standards and practices in agriculture and cocoa production. The work ethic of our labor force is not the only area of concern. In Trinidad and Tobago, Productive agricultural lands have suffered from the ravages of pradial larceny. And as much as pradial larceny is associated with the theft of fruits, vegetables, figs, and provision, there is in fact the risk that cocoa and coffee fields can become lucrative targets for those with a thirst for brown gold. Pradial larceny can diffuse passion and destroy the dreams of the farmer. Not related to cocoa. I can recall a personal anecdote by one, Dr. Floyd Homer, an ecologist and a peasant farmer, which in my mind demonstrated the debilitating impact that Puyle Lasny can have on a family's agricultural estate. He related to me and I quote, my family's six-acre citrus estate on the Toko Road near Sandy Grande was bulldozed last year because of the high incidence of pradial larceny that my family suffered from. I have to admit that I was taken back by his excellent definition of pradial larceny. 
He defined pradial larceny as teething with impunity. Yes, teething with impunity. And he went on, and I quote, he said, I could not get one bag of oranges because of theft, primarily by people in the village with whom I grew up, none of whom were willing to work on the estate. He continued, the estate could not generate the income to maintain itself, and after seven years of mounting financial losses, I cleared the land. But you know, there was a benefit in his clearing the land because he's now producing one of Trinbago's finest coffee. And what is to prevent that vicious cycle he spoke of from recurring and repeating itself? In that regard, there is need to expand, equip, and comprehensively train pradial larceny squads and have them de deployed in all the farming districts. I further submit that there may be a need for the creation of a special pradial larceny court to handle this disincentive to productive farming. Because such culprits need to be investigated, apprehended, charged, and prosecuted successfully and expeditiously to have the desired deterrent effect. Another problem. Proper land usage and management in Trinidad and Tobago are critical if we are to use cocoa production as a means of diversifying the economy. We have to shrug off this DYA, DWA syndrome, diversification without action. We need to move aggressively. We recognize that agriculture must be part of that diversification trust and we must aggressively act on it. Therefore, tongue and country planning and the Environmental Management Authority both bear a critical responsibility in supporting this trust, if that trust in great measure is the production of the best cocoa in the world. Therefore, it can no longer be business as usual, based perceptively on who you know or who knows you. Natural water courses are being blocked or diverted Hills are being denuded, and persons begin quarrying whenever they feel like. This scenario impacts negatively on cocoa and agricultural production, as in dry season, through such mispheasants. There's a lack of water supply, and in the rainy season, flooding, flooding often results. Further to this, the tongue and country planning in conjunction with the Ministry of Agriculture must ensure that housing schemes are no longer established on rich agricultural lands where cocoa and even other crops can be planted for maximum returns. We must stop building houses on good agricultural land if we are serious about earning foreign exchange. Based on agriculture and specifically on cocoa production, it appears to be in the short run more economically viable to some to simply survey land, separate into lots and sell, rather than to continue planting and harvesting cocoa beans because they feel such hard work is not commensurate with the desired remuneration they seek. So we therefore must aggressively protect our agricultural land. Developing land for houses on good agricultural land does not make sense and will not generate hard currency. The money generated through building on good agricultural land is static. Agriculturally productive lands have higher recurrent, recurrent economic yields. Do you want to hear of a money generate international agricultural model? that we could seriously consider in Trinidad and Tobago. And we can get there. We are fortunate to have two farmers in the Ministry of Agriculture. Let's look at, for example, the country of Denmark. Denmark's agricultural sector is said to produce enough food to feed 15 million people, 
which is almost three times the population of Denmark. What do they do with the rest? They export the rest for hard currency. Another feature of the Denmark model, over two-thirds of the land is used for agriculture. The annual harvest yield in plant production varied between 160 million to 170 million crop units, of which 60% are cereal crops. And here it is, over 90% of plant production is used as animal feed primarily for pigs and cattle. Another dilemma that we face is science into overdrive. The use, overuse, and misuse of insecticides, weedicides, pesticides, and chemicals in cocoa and agricultural production are detrimental to ecosystems, human and critical stakeholders in the production of the Trinitaria cocoa, the pollinators, the midges. Chemicals have been used in the quest to achieve a high yields at a fast rate and maximize profits from produce. This wanton abuse and the mindset that comes with it must stop. Chemicals, whether it was fed to animals or applied through broadcasting, sprayed with broom sprayers, knapsack sprayers, mist blowers, or even flooding of fields, have damaged our flora and fauna, driving them so far to almost extinction. Consider, for example, our local birds found in cocoa fields, such as the robin, the bullfinch, the picoplat, the shat. They are really seen feeding in our cocoa fields, although we, we, we have to be careful in that area. But we no longer see them in the grasslands, in the savannas. Even butterflies are becoming scarce. And farmers, you need to appreciate, therefore, that there is also a growing market for organic-based agricultural products. So penultimately, I would like to publicly commend the University of the West Indies and the Cocoa Research Unit for the critical role it is playing in encouraging farmers to engage in proper soil testing to maximize returns. Soil testing is the first stage in ensuring a successful and prosperous harvest. And our cocoa and coffee farmers need to ensure that this is done on their, in, on their, in their estates. Further, the Cocoa Research Center of UWI has been able to fortify its international reputation in cocoa research as well as the custodian of International Cocoa Gene Bank consisting of some 24,000 varieties of cocoa. Its research efforts, it has been stated, is focused on leveraging the genetic resources to find solutions to problems along the value chain. At present, I am pleased to be informed, and it is stated that it, that it is developing an international fine cocoa innovation center to showcase innovations along the entire value chain, that it will, it will house a modern cocoa orchard showcasing innovations in cocoa production, a primary processing facility showcasing innovations in post-harvest processing and quality management, a chocolate factory, and incubators to support product development, and even a cocoa ac academy. It will provide new technologies, apprenticeship training, it is stated, investment support, branding, and product development support towards developing the cocoa industry. There is also work at the University of the West Indies on pollination management to improve yield. And as been stated by, by, by Winston, and has been stated also, in fact, by the professor, Innovations are key in giving small island development states such as ours ability to compete on the international market. As I stated, it is not helpful to look at what went wrong and dwell on the past, but it is critical that we look ahead on how the potential of the cocoa industry can be harnessed to support the diversification of the country, not just financially, but in terms of the overall image and international reputation of Trinidad and Tobago. The Cocoa Research Center is a prepared gene bank and one of the oldest cocoa research centers in the world. The Trinidad Selected Hybrid Breeding Program has led to varieties with higher yield that are disease resistant, 
So it is therefore absolutely necessary that the authorities, the private sector, the universities, corporate world partner to overcome the constraints and to realize the potential of the cocoa industry. Let us build a modern cocoa industry using innovations along the entire value chain to give the maximum results we all crave for. Ladies and gentlemen, brown gold is back with us. We are here today for a genuine celebration. And I would like to first commend our cocoa farmers for keeping the faith, soldering on, and our local chocolatiers for producing the best cocoa in the world. Pope Francis knows about it. Only recently I read of one Dwayne Dove who had teamed up with a colleague and established in Sweden an upscale restaurant where rum and chocolate tastings are a special feature. And they have a collection of over 200 types of aged, mostly Caribbean rum. Considering, as far as I'm concerned, and I see it anywhere I go, we have the best rum in the world. And we also have the best cocoa in the world. So why not, for example, we don't engage in creating a concoction like what they do in Sweden, made in TNT, and that can become a tourist dream. I cannot, however, forget, and this is just to name a few because, of course, I'm not Akura with all of the chocolatiers, but I know of Coco Bell chocolates, the exotic Caribbean mountain pride, the Grand Coover fire dark chocolate, Genius chocolate, Genius cho chocolate tuffles, Oma Beans Organic, Solar Chocolate, and Classic Chocolates. And you all are doing a phenomenal job. I can tell you, I do recall in the case of Coco Bell Chocolates that in fact that when Vice President Biden and his wife visited the office of the President, she was quite enamored of the Coco Bell Chocolates as she tasted. So we want a good thing. And we need, in fact, to persevere and continue that dynamic entrepreneurship. So heartfelt congratulations to the awardees, these international awardees. And we need to continue to give them the prominence that it deserves. Because our cocoa, we, it is the baddest in the land. So thank you very much again, and, and soldier on. And of course, I can tell you the office of the president, in fact, is totally on board with your agenda, with the agenda of the, the, the authorities, with the, with the cocoa farmers. And in fact, one day we are hoping, in fact, my wife is hoping that she too would be producing chocolate um, made in Faisabad. So thank you very much.